May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and redeemer. Amen. So I want to talk for a moment just about the qualities of moms and ask a question. How many of you remember having a mom who loved you even in those moments when you were either unlovable or at least felt unlovable? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. It's that quality of a, of a mom, of a person, to be able to look beyond uh, what's going on in a person's life, maybe those things that they're struggling with, or those things that frustrate them, and be able to look at them and see something more and love them anyway. This is an amazing quality that we cherish and we celebrate in moms today. So keep that in mind as you're celebrating mom this Mother's Day. This quality is an example that we are to share as disciples as well. And not just as disciples, but as disciple makers, disciples who make other disciples. It's not easy to look beyond the things that frustrate or the things that hurt or the things that upset us and be able to see something more, see something beyond, see something that is still lovable, something that we can lift up and cherish. It's not easy to do that, but it is important. To examine this further, um, I really want to take a look at the relationship between, uh, between Paul and Barnabas. This is one of my favorite stories. I told Pam the other day as I was working on the sermon, I love this relationship. I love what happened with these two guys, and I love to be able to tell the story. So rather than beginning with the passage that we just heard, which we are going to get to, thank you so much, Aiden, for, for that. I want to go back to Acts 9 real quick and just establish how this whole thing began between Paul and Barnabas. And this is what Acts 9 says. It says, when Paul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So we went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. The beginning of this relationship between Paul and Barnabas was one where Paul, we know his history, we know who he was, was coming after having the experience of God, knowing that he was called to do something more, was not being received well. But Barnabas saw something in him. Barnabas saw what God was doing in the midst. God, Barnabas could see the call. So he took him in. And he spoke for him. He stood up for him. He presented him to the others. Paul didn't have to say a word. Barnabas spoke about what was going on, what God was doing in Paul's life, and made him presentable, made him accepted, and took him around to help him begin that entire journey that would then take place. So the question is this, though. Would we be willing to do that? If we knew that there was someone that had been harming the church, someone that had been harming others in the, in the midst of the community and everything else, how easy would it be for us to look beyond what they had done, to look into what they were about to do or what God was calling them to do and be able to lift them up before the body? That is an amazing quality. That is an amazing thing that Barnabas has done. 
what would it look like if we were able to see more in others than even they are able to see and help them become something even more than they imagined becoming? To see more in them than they could see. To help them become something even more than they knew they could become. That is one of the driving forces for me being in youth ministry and working with other leaders because that's what we do with youth on a daily basis. I'm not saying they're not lovable. They completely are. You should have seen the tears coming down our face at the lock-in when we were celebrating our seniors and uh, everything. It's, we love them. They are lovable. Sometimes they do unlovable things. I could say that because I have children that are in the youth group. I know this full well, but I love them completely and fully. They are, they are wonderful, but it's that whole thing of helping them to see what is in them that maybe they can't see and helping them become something that they may not have even thought of becoming yet. Uh, that is the joy of being a youth leader. That's the joy of being a youth pastor. That's the joy of being able to be involved in their lives and help them see what God sees in them. One of the greatest opportunities that we have as a whole church is to participate in confirmation like we have been doing over the past year. Because even if you're not a youth leader, you have the opportunity as a whole church just to be praying for, encouraging, and following along the faith journey of our confirmands. Maybe you were blessed to be asked by one of the confirmands to be their mentor. Or maybe you were, you were blessed by being appointed to be an ex-con to one of the confirmands. Or maybe your even greater blessing is to be a parent of one of the confirmation kids. You have the opportunity to walk with them and go forth in this journey with them. You have the opportunity to speak for them in front of the whole church. Just as we've had the confirmands come forward and share, we've also heard stories from mentors and teachers about the many blessings that they're seeing in the life of the confirmands that's being Barnabas for them. See, we have the opportunity to pray for and to bless and to send the confirmands off to serve. That's what it's all about. We take them on a journey of discovering what is it that you believe helping them to affirm a faith in Christ. Hopefully that's what they affirm, but we get to take them on a journey of discovering what it means to have a faith in Christ and what that looks like and what that does for them. And then as a community, we bring them forth. We give them the opportunity to say what it is that they believe. We pray over them. We anoint them. We bless them. And then we send them. We send them back into the church. We send them into the community. We send them to where God is calling them to be so that they can do the things that God is calling them to do in their life, in their community, in their church. In a perfect world, that's what it looks like every single time. And that's what we hope for and pray for every time we lead a group through confirmation. If we take a look at today's passage, we see some of that going on. In the early church, when they had the catechumenate process, confirmation would take place on Easter. And then from Easter to Pentecost would be a time of exploring who is God calling you to be? What is your specific calling? What is it that you are going to be in the life of the church? And then on Pentecost, that person would be brought forward with the deacons and the priests and they would announce what that person's calling was. And the entire community would come around that person, lay hands on them, pray for them, bless them, and then they would send them to go and do that calling. What an amazing thing. So what do we have? We have Paul and we have Barnabas, who the Holy Spirit has come in and said, I am setting them apart for something more. So what does the community do? They respond to that calling of the Holy Spirit. They lay hands, they bless them, and then they send them. Then they send them. What an amazing thing it is to be open to what the Holy Spirit is saying. To recognize that God has something special in the life of other people that we can celebrate, bless, affirm, and empower, and encourage. 
Does that make sense? That's what's taking place in this moment. That's what the church has done. That's what launches Paul and Barnabas into their first journey. This is something that empowered their relationship even more. So it's not just Barnabas being a, a mentor of sorts, but now it is Paul and Barnabas coming together and being a part of ministry as partners together in this. The cool thing to know, well, let's see. I lost my space. I'm sorry. Um, so the one thing that um, struck me, too, is the idea of this also reminding and hearkening back to the ordination process we have as a church. We look towards people that are receiving a call or that are experiencing a call or that the rest of the church is looking at that person and noticing a call and we begin to walk them through a process of seeing whether they are being set apart by God for something else because that's the neat thing that it says in here. The Holy Spirit says, set these two apart for ministry and that's what happens in the midst of ordination. Our call is from and of God. And God chooses to use the church as the community through which our call is discerned, nurtured, blessed, and mobilized. <coughs> Do you hear that? In the church, we help to discern, we help to nurture, we help to bless, and we help to mobilize people in their call. God chooses to use the church for that. That is something we have as a blessing from God to be a part of in helping other people discern that call and then to live out that call. I really wanted to highlight something that we've touched on already, but I think is vital for us to understand and take to heart as disciples of Christ. Had it not been for the faithfulness and optimism of Barnabas, we may have never seen one letter from Paul. Which means we may have never seen churches pop up all over the place from their journeys. We may not even have the church today as we know it at all. It took faithfulness. Listening for God above our own emotions, fears, and understandings sometimes. It takes that faithfulness that Barnabas had. It also took the optimism that Barnabas had, believing that God can and will do something special in and through the lives of the least likely. And if I'm honest, like me, any other least likelies in the room? One of the incredible blessings of God is if we go through scripture, we find that God loved to use a lot of least likelies uh, in ministry in amazing ways. And we need to thank God for that because it means that there's a place for us, uh, for God to call us and to use us. You see, this quality of Barnabas, this is a quality that was just part of the makeup of who he was, I believe. Just before Paul and Barnabas' second journey is another one of my favorite stories from Acts 15. They got into a huge fight. Got into a huge fight. And listen to the story a little bit, and you're going to hear how the quality works, because remember, we started with Barnabas seeing something in Paul, believing in him, and taking him forth, and celebrating him, and making him presentable in front of the community, right? Well, here we are. Paul and Barnabas are about to embark on their second journey. And Barnabas comes to Paul and says, hey, let's go back and get my cousin, John Mark, and we'll get him to go with us on this second journey. And Paul's like, forget it. See, John Mark had gone with them on the first journey. But at some point in the midst of the journey, he decided he was done and he went home and he left them. Paul couldn't get over this. Paul didn't want anything to do with it. He's like, no, we couldn't depend on him. We couldn't trust him. He left us in the first journey. I'm not taking him on this journey. And that became a conflict point for Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas saw something in John Mark. Barnabas saw something in him that he believed in. 
Barnabas saw something where he felt like God was calling him to something more and wanted to go after him. So literally, they parted wings. Paul went on his way. Barnabas went and got John Mark and went on his way. We know from scripture that later John Mark and Paul were back together again. They were even in prison together. So that relationship came back together again. And there's, you know, differences in scholarship and everything else, but a story that I love to hear, whether it's myth or reality or whatever, but some believe that the author of the Gospel of Mark was actually John Mark. So what would it have been if Barnabas didn't go back after him and knock on that door and say, hey, come with me on this journey? So myth or reality, it's a cool story. But it looks at the heart of Barnabas. Barnabas had this ability to see into someone else's life and see something more than they could see. To know that they could be something more than they were being and help them to do that. He did that for, Bar for Paul and he also did that for John Mark. So disciples, I ask you, who is your Paul? Who is your John Mark? Who are you being called to be a Barnabas for today? The good news is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That proves God lo God's love toward us. Just as Saul, just as Paul, was embraced by Christ along the road. Given back his sight by Ananias. Believed in and spoken up for to the church by Barnabas, and then anointed and blessed for service and ministry by the church, we are to live out this example as well. Ones who listen for the movement of God, that look for the movement of God, and actually participate and respond to it. To hear God say, I need you to go and help restore this person's sight. To hear God say, I have something special for this person. So even though the disciples are saying, no, I need you to take them in and make them presentable. Those are the types of qualities that we need to live into as disciples who are disciple makers. I am really thankful that Epworth is a church that nurtures people for ministry like Jim Bulliard and like Joy Katanga and people for mission like Anna and Nathan and Abigail. Epworth also produces amazing small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, volunteers and leaders in all of the mission areas of Epworth and so many more. We should be incredibly thankful for this but remember for every one of these leaders it took someone standing up to be a Barnabas for them. Maybe it was their mom, or maybe it was you. Beloved, I ask, be a Barnabas for someone and watch what God does. Amen? Amen. So your discipleship commitment today is mainly that. Be a Barnabas for someone. As disciples of Christ, be faithful in your calling and be encouraging of those you discern are being set apart for mission and ministry for God. Be an encourager. Be someone who nurtures. Be someone who guides something into more than they know that they are. And watch what God does in the midst of their life. Amen.